Hi there. My name is AJ Lowick. I'm a non-binary trans person. I use they, them, their pronouns. And I'm also a PhD candidate with the Institute for Gender, Race, Sexuality, and Social Justice at the University of British Columbia in Vancouver, British Columbia, Canada. I'd like to start off by acknowledging the incredible privilege that it is to live and work and love on the unceded and stolen lands of the Musqueam, Squamish, and Tsleil-Waututh First Nations peoples. I'm thrilled to be a part of this project and to be sharing a really quick intro to the work that I do. Broadly speaking, the work that I do and my research interests fall under this umbrella of trans people's reproductive lives and health. So if it has anything to do with trans people's reproductive lives and health, I uh, conduct research in that area and I also train reproductive health care providers on how to better serve trans people. I came to this work having uh, been employed in the abortion sector, working in abortion care spaces, and I realized as I was coming to terms with my own gender identity that uh, abortion services as they were being delivered would present barriers for trans folks. And so I dedicated my master's thesis to both identifying and strategizing solutions to those barriers so that we could create trans inclusive abortion services here in Canada. The result of that work was a manual called the Trans Inclusive Abortion Services Manual, and it provided a lot of information as well as uh, suggestions for policies and practices for abortion care providers on how to better serve trans people as patients. My PhD then expands upon that work and looks at reproductive life and health more generally. So whether that's menstruation, pregnancy, childbirth, miscarriage, uh, menopause, the use of assisted reproductive technologies or fertility preservation technologies, endometriosis, polycystic ovarian syndrome, uh, infertility as a result of uh, hormonal or uh, hormone or surgery interventions as a part of medical transition. Essentially, if it has anything to do with reproduction and reproductive life, I'm, I'm interested in it and how trans folks navigate it and make decisions about it and experience healthcare uh, when it comes to their reproductive bodies. Um, the bit of work that I'm working on right now is a chapter of my dissertation where I'm trying to unpack the relationship between cis normativity, heteronormativity, repronormativity, and trans normativity, which is a lot of normativities. Um, Really simply speaking, cis normativity is this assumption and expectation that all people will be cisgender, where trans folks are the exception. Heteronormativity is uh, built on cis normativity and assumes that all people will be heterosexual, where uh, queer folks or folks with diverse sexual orientations or identities are the exception. Repronormativity is a set of assumptions that expects reproductive life to occur. Essentially, it normalizes reproduction um, and expects all human beings to desire reproduction. In particular, repronormativity reminds us that uh, female assigned bodies and women identified people are often maternalized. And so we have uh, tiny tiny girls, small young people, uh, being raised with the expectation that they will become mothers. And then for cisgender women of a variety of ages, we see things like hysterectomy and tubal ligation being gag kept by medical practitioners. And the, it's a kind of repronormative patronizing practice of safeguarding their fertility um, because the expectation and assumption is that they will they will ultimately desire the use of their reproductive capacities and potentials. So that's repronormativity. And then all of this is caught up in transnormativity, which is a set of expectations and assumptions to which we hold trans people accountable. And by we, I mean society, the law, journalists, the media, and healthcare providers. And so it's typically assumed that trans people will identify along the binary, be, be it as either trans men or trans women, which leaves non-binary folks out. Um, and it is further assumed that trans folks will access or at least desire access to medical transition to hormones and surgery as a part of their, uh, as a part of their transition, which leaves out all kinds of folks who either don't, can't, or don't want to, um, to access those kinds of medical interventions. And that transnormativity, those set of standards that we hold trans people account accountable to, have cis, hetero, and repronormative components to them. And that's what I'm unpacking right now. If you consider, for example, that a trans man, in order to um, be granted legitimacy or authenticity or legibility, intelligibility over his identity, as a condition of that, will be expected to reject um, pregnancy, reject menstruation um, as a kind of demonstration of his madness. Uh, that is 
cis hetero repronormativities at work in the transnormative rhetoric. So the idea here being that we use cisgender people and their relationship to their reproductive bodies as the standard, as the default, and then trans people are expected to uh, conform to that. And a lack of conformity to those cis hetero repronormative assumptions um, delegitimizes or threatens the quote, credibility or authenticity of that trans person. And of course, we know trans people have really rich reproductive lives and do all kinds of reproductive things and form families in all kinds of beautiful ways that don't conform to those various discourses and logics. But nevertheless, there is this kind of expectation that trans folks will transition from one fixed position to another, and in doing so, will reject the reproductive life that came with their so-called former or assigned at birth sex or gender. And so my work seeks to unpack all of this, to like tease cis, hetero, repro, and transnormativities out, and to demonstrate the ways that these logics um, impact decision making and impact healthcare access. And the goal is ultimately to um, to teach healthcare providers how to do better by trans people, to have healthcare providers anticipate that trans people will be using their reproductive bodies in all kinds of rich and beautiful ways or not using them. Um, and as a result that healthcare providers ought to be better equipped and, and anticipate that trans people will be among their patients. Um, so ultimately what I do is I train healthcare providers um, on how to do better, on how to better serve trans folks. And I research trans reproductive life and health um, in order to have the kind of knowledge that we need in order to make healthcare spaces better for us. Um, obviously, trans reproductive health is um, a very understudied area. And so I'm thrilled to be able to contribute um, to that to the extent that I'm capable at this stage in my career, um, but thrilled and optimistic about what the future will hold for this field uh, and for trans people's re reproductive lives and family forming practices. Uh, ultimately, the goal is to make trans lives more livable and um, for folks to be able to do what they want to with their reproductive bodies and to not be susceptible to or in, have their decisions constricted by cis, hetero, repro, and transnormative assumptions and expectations. So that's me. That's what I'm working on right now. Um, ultimately, my goal is to have trans or have healthcare providers anticipate that trans people will be their patients, will be in their spaces. Um, and so this project is wonderful because it reminds us that trans people should also be anticipated in academia, uh, that we are here, that we are plentiful, that we are both doing research related to transness and not. Um, and so the next time you're wondering if there are trans folks in the academy, hi, how are you? Please feel free to send me an email and reach out. I'm always up for a chat about my Como vuelven en 